We are in Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5 tonight. <clears throat> Last week we did an introduction of the high priesthood of who? Does anybody remember? The high priesthood of? I wasn't here, but I'm guessing it's going to have to be Melchizedek. No. We did a background study of the high priesthood of Aaron. Okay, of Aaron. Okay, and uh, the reason we do that is because uh, the writer is about to get into a discussion of the contrast between the Old Testament priesthood and the New Testament priesthood in chapter 5. It's going to be a very brief discussion in this particular chapter, and then he's going to come back to it again in a couple more chapters, around Hebrews chapter 7. And it's very interesting what he has to say about that priesthood. So we did some reading in the Old Testament about the high priesthood of Aaron. Uh, true or false? Aaron had uh, been called of God to this office. True. He had been called of God to this office. True or false? In order to become a high priest, you had to be anointed to the position. Yes, you were anointed to the position. Uh, the high priest wore a special garb when he ministered in his office. True. What were some of the items that were uh, in that particular uh, garb that he wore? A mitre, which was a what? A hat, a headpiece, right? And what did that mitre say on it? Anybody remember? Holy, holy, one, yeah. holy one to the Lord. Remember? He was the one who was consecrated. He was the one who was set apart from all others. Uh, what was another very special piece of his garment? A breastplate, yes. And there were two items that we mentioned being on that breastplate. Does anybody remember what they are? Okay, yes, there were a set of stones on there. And each one of those stones represented one of the twelve tribes. And then there was also something else very special on there, which was the... Yes, the, the Urim and the Thummim. Okay, the Urim and the Thummim. Uh, and what were those, what was that for? Does anybody remember? Yes, they assisted him in the judgment of the people. Now, if there were one downfall of the Old Testament priesthood, what was it? Absolutely. The priest was a mere human who had sinned and transgressed the law of God just like all the other individuals in Israel. Okay? And that's a huge difference between that priesthood and our priesthood because we have a priest who is tempted in all points like as we are yet what? Without sin. He had no sin whatsoever. And so... Um, um, there's a contrast that is there. We're entering into chapter 5 and uh, we're going to be talking about three points in this particular chapter. And uh, the writer always interests me in how he does his uh, discussions, okay? He's going to talk first about the human high priest, okay? The human high priest. Approximately how many priests were in the office of high priest from the time of Aaron all the way until the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem. Does anybody remember? Yeah, 70 to 80 high priests occupied that office. Okay, so that's quite a few high priests. And um, so we're going to talk about this human high priest in verses 1 through 4. He then is going to turn our attention to the heavenly high priest. And he's talking about our heavenly high priest. Okay, That earthly high priest belonged to what? To the Old Testament, to the, to the Mosaic law, to the Jews. Okay, An earthly, a human high priest. We have a what? We have a heavenly high priest. We have who is our high priest? Jesus Christ, the Son of God. When he gets through talking about Jesus for a little bit, he then all of a sudden just stops the conversation and he directs the attention directly upon his readers. And he's going to talk to them about the hearing of the Hebrews. 
Okay, he's going to talk to them about their own personal hearing of the things that he's discussing and the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And it's going to be, it's just interesting how he stops everything and he, all of a sudden, he just looks at them and begins to talk to them again. Okay, in a very direct way manner. And it'll be another one of the exhortations of this particular book. So we have the human high priest, the heavenly high priest, and then the hearing of the Hebrews. So let's start with the human high priest. Larry? Wow. Done away. And they finally decided that the Sanhedrin, which still exists, uh, would decide who the high priest was going to be. Wow. And see, the Sanhedrin was uh, uh, in existence in Jesus' day, but they weren't the ones who made the decision as to the high priest. Okay. Uh, how was it supposed to be calculated? Does anybody remember? It should have been lineage genealogy, shouldn't it? Okay. Uh, the, there was the destruction of the temple of uh, Jerusalem in, um, um, let's see, 586 B.C. Okay, that was Solomon's temple. It was rebuilt 70 plus years later. And from that time onward, the high priesthood became a very political position. In the days of Jesus, who determined who the high priest was? Yes, the Roman Caesar, and who had the most money to supply him with the money that he wanted for the office. It just it quit being a true uh, scriptural position at that particular point. And the Sanhedrin were the aristocracy. I mean, not the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees were the aristocracy of the day. And so it was the Sadducees who had the rule of the high priesthood in the days of Jesus. Were they a scriptural lot? No. They were p pitiful, weren't they? They didn't believe in spirits. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in hell. There's just a lot of things that they didn't believe in, and yet they had charge of what? Of the high priesthood. Okay, very high position. Okay, so, uh, uh, and, and that even after Jesus came and died and ascended to the right hand of God and Christianity had begun, folks, Judaism still continued, did it not? And it continued until when? Until the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay? At the destruction of Jerusalem, everything radically changed, folks. Okay, no more what? No more sacrifices. No, because there's no more temple, right? Okay, no more genealogies. So they don't know their lineages anymore. I mean, there's a lot of things that radically changed in AD 70. And God brought, uh, as far as a true system of faith, as it used to be in the Old Testament, He brought it all to an end in AD 70. Okay, and so a very uh, unique time, one that's prophesied in the pages of the New Testament. So uh, right now the writer is writing, and guess what? The, high, the, the priesthood is still in existence at this particular time. And so, uh, you know, we're somewhere before 8070 at this particular time in the writing of the book of Hebrews. And he's talking about this Old Testament priesthood, this high priest. Notice first, um, Hebrews 5 verse 1, his station. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now he tells us a lot in this particular text about this particular individual. Notice first he talks about his rank. What does he call him? A high priest. Another way we could say it is the chief priest. Right? He is the priest of the priests. Okay, And there was only supposed to be how many? One was all there was supposed to be. Now, when Jesus came along, there was sometimes more than one put into that particular position because remember, it was political. Okay, But it was supposed to have been one human being, a high priest, the chief of priests. Notice secondly, 
his relationship. He says this, He has taken from among men, watch this, for who? For men. Okay? Let me ask you something. In the church today, do we have elevated positions in the body of Christ? Positions of power, positions of authority? Yeah. Okay? One of them being an elder. Another being a deacon. Okay? And uh, I find it interesting that in uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, um, the Apostle Paul, speaking to the elders of Ephesus, said that they were selected by the Holy Spirit. Did he not? Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and in all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. How is it that the Holy Spirit makes men overseers? How does that happen? Absolutely. The Holy Spirit has revealed the qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1. And when you meet those qualifications given by the Holy Spirit, then guess what? You can be appointed as an elder of the church. You are taken from among men, and watch this, for men. Guys, this is a service position. When I say this, I'm talking about the high priesthood now. Okay? This is not supposed to be a power position. It's not supposed to be this, oh, I'm authoritarian type position. The same is true of an eldership. Okay? Yes, they have authority. And yes, they have power. And yes, they have the responsibility of doing certain things. But you're taken from among men for men. That's the relationship that you have. Um, we call our elected officials civil what? Servants. That's what they're supposed to be. Guys, they're elected not for power, but to what? Serve. To serve among men. Okay? And it's that way in the church, and it was that way at this particular time. Notice that he says that they were ordained for men. That little word ordained means to place down permanently. That is to designate, constitute, convey, appoint, make, ordain, set. Thayer says to set, to place, to put, to appoint one, to administer to an office. Who is it that put those men in power? God did. God did. Now guys, anybody that God puts in power should be what? Should be respected, shouldn't he? You know, the, the high priest wasn't always a perfect person. I'll guarantee you that. The high priest sometimes was corrupt and vile in the way that they handled and conducted themselves. But when God puts a man in power, guess what? We respect that man. Okay? Because he's ordained of who? He's ordained of God. Okay? Whether I like that or not, whether I appreciate him or not, doesn't matter. He's ordained of God. He's been put there by God. And that's the way this particular man is. Now notice his realm. Okay? Things pertaining to who? to God. Okay? Guys, it was never designated to be a political position. Okay? His sole responsibility, his sole obligation was to minister in things pertaining to who? To God. The overseeing of the temple, the overseeing of the sacrifices, the making certain that the people were judged correctly because of his office, okay? It, it was never supposed to be a political position, but uh, that, that's the way it became. Notice his responsibility, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices. For who? For sin. Notice that little word, offer. To bear towards, to lead to, to tender to God, to treat. Thayer says that the word offer means to bring to, lead to a person who can heal him, who is ready to show him some kindness. Bring a present or thing. Folks, the high priest always stood between who and who? Yes. The giver of the sacrifice and the receiver of the sacrifice. Okay? Always stood in between those two individuals. He was the one who would offer up gifts for the people. 
Okay? Notice gifts and sacrifices for sin and offense. To be without share in, to miss the mark, to err, to be mistaken, to miss or wander from the path of uprightness, to wander from the law of God, to violate God's law. Uh, was such a man really needed? Why? Uh, because there was sin among the people, was there not? Okay? And so they needed a man in that position. So God designated this one man, the high priest, to be this go-between, between sinners and who? And God. Notice Hebrews 5.2, his sympathy. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are not of the way? For that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. Wow. Notice his passion. Who can have compassion? To be moderate in passion. That is gentle. To treat indulgently. To be affected moderately or in due measure. Of one who is not unduly disturbed by the errors, faults, sins of others. But bears them how? Gently. Man. Is it easy to have compassion on the sinner? It's not easy. Now that's what the high priest was supposed to do. Okay, notice what he says. He says, who can have compassion on? And he mentions two groups, the ignorant and who? Those that are erring, those who are wandering out of the way. Now think about that. To bear patiently with. To deal gently with. That's not easy to do, is it? Somebody lies. Somebody cheats. Somebody commits adultery. Somebody murders another. And where are we, guys, when, when those things happen? What's, what's, our, what's our first response to those kind of people? Oh man, we're angry. We're upset. We want to deal with them. They need to be punished. Right? And yet, here's this high priest who's been put there to do what? To be compassionate. Who's he modeling? Ah... He's modeling Jesus, isn't he? Folks, aren't you glad that God doesn't treat us with great hostility the moment we sin? Aren't you glad that when you and I go to Him, it's not with a heart of condemnation that He approaches us. It's a heart of compassion that He approaches us with. He wants to deal gently with us. He wants to treat us with as much goodwill as He possibly can. Folks, God doesn't want anybody to be destroyed. God doesn't want anybody to be lost. And so when someone came to the high priest, guess what? He was supposed to be treated with what? With gentleness. Now think about Jesus during His crucifixion. Who was He brought to immediately? The high priest. And folks, if there were anybody who was supposed to have been in Jesus' corner, guess who it should have been? The high priest. In fact, he should have very quickly come to the conclusion that Jesus is what? He's innocent. He's done nothing amiss. He is a just man. And he should have released that man immediately. But it had become political, hadn't it? And you see, he didn't treat Jesus with compassion and gentleness the way he ought to. See, Jesus knows what it's like to be mistreated by who? The high priest. He knows what that's like. Folks, he experienced it during his crucifixion. So guess what he is not going to do with us? He will never treat us unfairly and with harshness and with rudeness, and with inequity as we approach Him. 
And that's the way it should have been with the high priest in Jesus' day. Notice the persons. Okay, we looked at his passion that he was supposed to have to bear with them gently. The persons, the ignorant. One who does not know through lack of information or intelligence. The ignorant. Those that know not. Those that understand not. To be ignorant, to not know, to not understand, to err or sin through mistake, to be wrong. Do some people err out of ignorance? Oh yeah. Let me ask you something. Does ignorance still pervade the body of Christ today? Mm -hmm. Ignorance pervades the body of Christ, folks. Okay? We're not students of the Word of God the way we used to be. Okay? Those old timers, they could quote the Bible. You know that? Those old timers, they knew exactly where those passages were. They knew the fundamentals, didn't they? And we've lost a lot of that in the body of Christ today. So, guess what we have among us? A lot of ignorance, don't we? And guys, ignorance can upset the knowledgeable real quick, can it? Can almost just make you plumb mad. Well, you big dummy. Right? But you see, that's not the way our high priest treats us. The ignorant come to him, and guess what he does? He deals gently with them. He treats them with compassion. He looks on them like a shepherd would look at a sheep. And folks, guess what sheep are? Little dummies. Okay? Now that's sad that we're described that way, isn't it? <laughs> but we are a lot of times, aren't we? Okay? And sometimes it may not be ignorance of the Word of God per se, but it's ignorance of the consequences of our action. Couldn't it be? We think, we think we can just keep doing this particular sin or that particular sin or involve ourselves in this transgression or that transgression or this behavior or that behavior and everything's fine. And all of a sudden, guess what? It's not fine, is it? And we go to Jesus and guess what? We're met with what? Compassion. And that's the way it was supposed to be with the high priest. Notice also, on them that are out of the way. How many ways are there? There's just one, isn't there? And Jesus made it clear today exactly what that way is. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I'm the only way. Okay? Is it easy to get out of the way? It's easy to step out of the way, isn't it? Folks, all we have to do is let our guard down for a minute or two, and guess what? We can veer from the path, can't we? It's easy to do. Notice how Thayer describes it, to go astray, to wander, to roam, to be led away from truth, to be led into error, to be led from the path of virtue, to go astray, to sin. You know what? I'm kind of glad that these two categories exist because sometimes Vic finds himself in one of those two categories. Ignorant or what? out of the way. And notice when, they, when, when the ignorant and out of the way come to the high priest in the Old Testament, okay, they're coming with their sacrifice and they, they tell the high priest what they've done and why they're there. What's the high priest supposed to do? Is he supposed to cut them off? Is he supposed to condemn them? Is he supposed to speak roughly to them? Is he supposed to make them feel their ignorance and their stupidity because of what they've done? No. He treats them how? With gentleness. Folks, here's, here's who in operation. Here's Christ in operation with us. And that's what we always need to remember. As we watch this Old Testament high priest, we always need to realize that what he was commanded to do, what he was responsible to do, is what Jesus is doing for us today. But he's doing it with what? With perfection, isn't he? With absolute perfection. Now let me ask you something. 
We said a while ago, when somebody errs out of ignorance or somebody commits sin and they go out of the way, that oftentimes we can be pretty rough on them, can't we? Why should we not? Or maybe I should, let me rephrase the question. How is it that the high priest of the Old Testament could bear so gently with those who had sinned and who had come to him? Ah, notice the parallel. For that he himself also is compassed about with infirmity. Who am I? To treat somebody in sin roughly. Who am I not to show compassion on somebody who's in violation of the will of God? Because I too am what? A sinner, aren't I? Do you remember the story about that Jesus told of the man who was forgiven of much sin? Great debt forgiven. And what did he immediately go do? He runs out there, finds his fellow servant that just owed him a few dollars and casts him into prison till he pays, doesn't he? Wow, there you go. There's us. We're pretty hard on other people, and we shouldn't be, folks. Because we too fall in that same camp, don't we? We're sinners. And we sin against God. He's compassed. To lie all around that is enclosed, encircled, hampered, to be bound with. There it says to lie around, to be compassed, to have around. Guys, guess what's all around us? We too are compassed with sin. It's all what? It's all around us. Even though we're children of God, it's still what? It's in our life. Even though we fight it so much harder than the world does, it's still in our lives, isn't it? And because of that, we ought to be able to deal gently with sinners. And that is exactly what the responsibility of this high priest is. Notice that he says he's encompassed about with infirmity, feebleness of body or mind, malady, moral frailty, one of strength of the soul to restrain corrupt desires. Every one of us live our lives perfectly every day, don't we? No. We handle our friends just the way they're supposed to be handled. We handle our kids just the way they're supposed to be handled. We handle every church member just the way they're supposed to be handled. We handle our husband and wife just perfectly. Our mom and dads. We don't do that, do we? You see, we have infirmity and we're compassed about with infirmity. And so, who am I to just quickly go out there and start condemning another and just try to shove it in his face about how bad a person he is? No, what I should do is what? Have compassion on him, shouldn't I? And I should feel what he feels and I should understand where he's coming from and I should do everything I could do to what? To help him get out of what he's in. And that was the responsibility of the high priest. Would it take a special person to be a high priest? Guys, just think about this. This is your job every day. Every day. You want to know one of the worst positions that I find in the church today? Benevolence. I hate it. I, I don't, if somebody said, Dick, come on, be a deacon. We're going to make you a deacon over benevolence. I say, I'll just remain a member. Right? Okay? And there's several reasons for that. Number one, guys, you're always going to have benevolent cases. Aren't you? Now just think, you know, the first six months you're excited, you're a new deacon, and boy, so, somebody knocks on your door, and boy, you just want to do what? Help, 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 help. And you just, boy, you're just loving this job. And then all of a sudden, that dude comes back again, telling you a different story. And it's not one of them, it's two of them, five of them, ten of them. And then you help and you find out that they misused the money that you gave them. They were supposed to go get food, but what they got were beer. Right? 
They told you that they're going to take the money and they're going to get a bus ticket and go to see their mama. And you give them money and guess where you find them this evening at Walmart begging somebody else for a bus ticket. Let me tell you something, folks. It doesn't take you long to become cynical when that's what you do every day. Now think about the high priest. Every day, people are coming to him with this sin and that sin and this sin and that sin and this wrong and that wrong. Can he become cynical? Be easy to get cynical. Get hard. Especially when that same person is coming again and again and again. It's tough. It takes a special person to operate in the position of high priest. And guess what? God saw something in Aaron. Was Aaron compassed about with infirmities? Um, well, yeah, kind of. I think he was. Guys, you can just point out two or three times in Aaron's life where he messed up pretty badly. You know what? He kind of got in there with his sister, didn't he? Challenging Moses about his position and his authority. Where was Aaron? When that golden calf was being built, was he at the foot of Sinai? Did he know what was going on? Did he not know what? We don't know for certain, do we? He wasn't a perfect man by any means, that's for certain. And so, when God put him in that position, if he really looked at his life and the way he was, then he ought to be able to what? Sympathize with those other sinners. And that's why he's put there. That's part of his job. Now notice Hebrews 5.3. Here's something that's totally different between our high priest and the Old Testament high priest. For by reason hereof, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sin. Now what does he mean by that? And by reason hereof, because he has what? Sin and infirmities. He ought, guys, there's two, two or three words in Scripture that are very, very important. Ought is one of them. Must is one of them. The is one of them. And is one of them. We don't put much importance on those little words. But notice the, the writer says he ought to do this. What does that mean? Ought. O-U-G-H-T. Should. should. <laughs> yes, should. He should. What does it mean? I mean, must. Yeah, guys. There is a bound obligation that is placed upon him. Okay? There's no getting around it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. He ought, he must do this. And what does he have to do? As for the people, so, offer, so also for himself to offer for sins. Wow. Now just think about that. Before he does anything this day, right, in his high priesthood position, he has to go into the temple, and what does he have to do? He offers a sacrifice... For who? For me. He watches that little lamb bleed out because of what he has done. Is that pretty good? You have to do that every time. Before you start this position of ministering in the high priest office, you've got to first do what? Offer sacrifice for self. When people come to us and they have these problems and these difficulties, what's the first thing we need to do? <coughs> Take heed to ourselves. How about go to God, like you said, on our own behalf? God, I'm not perfect. God, I've sinned. And I plead your forgiveness. And I want your forgiveness especially as I do what? as I go to help this individual who is in sin and iniquity as well. You see, there's an obligation to be what? Holy. Before we what? Deal with the sins of others. And boy, that's a toughie, isn't it? 
But you see, that's what this particular individual's responsibility was. Okay? He ought to be under obligation to do so. Notice his selection. This is verse 4. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was who? Aaron. Guys, notice the first point. Self-appointment. No man puts himself into the office. Okay? This idea of buying the office violated what? Violated the law of God. I wonder how God looked down from heaven upon the high priesthood during the days of Jesus. Don't you know it just upset his soul to see what was going on? Because no man takes that office to himself, taketh to get hold of, to take with the hand, to lay hold of in order to use it, to claim for oneself, to take possession of. No man taketh this honor, notice that, this honor unto himself. Guys, it was a valued, esteemed, high degree of dignity within the office. You know that? Is there, well, what, is the, what does the Bible say about elders? What, what does the Bible tell us as members of the church to do for elders? To hold them in honor, right? Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. You see, it's, it's a valued position, folks. It's a high position as far as God is concerned. You see, we become so common. It becomes so commonplace to us that we forget the dignity of the position. When God uses that term honor, it means what? This position that He's put in place is something to be looked upon with deep respect. And sometimes it's tough to do, but God calls us to do that. Notice His selection. He is called of God. To call, to bid, to call, to invite, to be called, to bear a name or title among men. And notice he says, as was who? Aaron. He gives the example. Exodus 18, 1. And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother, and his sons with him, from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Even Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, Aaron's son. Wow. Can you imagine being Aaron being the first high priest? I can't imagine that. You know that? I've never been the first at nothing. That's terrible English. But I've never been the first at anything. And to be the first high priest called of God. Wow. Guys, we've learned a lot of things about this high priest, haven't we? In, that, in those four short verses. And now what he's going to do, he's going to get into those next three or four verses and he's going to contrast Jesus with that high priest. And he's going to talk about our heavenly high priest. And he's going to use a term that he hasn't used up to this particular point as he describes Jesus. Okay? It's going to get gooder, I promise. Thank you. Man, we need about two hours.